Open your Bibles this morning, if you would please, to the book of Hebrews in chapter number 4. Our text today is going to be uh, found in one verse, and uh, that's going to be our starting point. Uh, We started a new series of messages uh, last uh, Sunday. Last Sunday I preached uh, on, Does It Matter? And of course the topic was the inerrancy of Scripture. Does it really matter that we have a Bible that is uh, without error? Now, believe it or not, you'd be amazed at the people that are uh, 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 religious leaders that would tell you, eh, you don't necessarily need to believe it all. Uh, You'd be amazed uh, even uh, to find out that there are uh, seminaries across the nation that is supposed to be training uh, preachers to go out and share the Word of God with people that would uh, be telling, well, you don't necessarily need to believe it all. Uh, Let me tell you something. If you don't believe all the Bible, then guess what? You begin to doubt all of the Bible. Uh, As far as I'm concerned, it's a package deal. You believe it all or you doubt it all. And uh, so uh, we dealt with that uh, to some degree on last week. Today, we're looking at, does it matter a sinless Savior? A sinless Savior. Uh, Is Jesus really someone that was born without sin, lived without sin, died without sin? Now, to be very honest, uh, that's a little foreign to our understanding, is it not? Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I've come to the conclusion I I battle sin every day of my life. I mean, uh, I'm I'm, uh, uh, getting uh, up into the the older uh, years of life, and yet I still battle with sin. Uh, Sometimes all it takes is a a trip to Walmart, and I battle with sin. Uh, Driving through Atlanta. If you can do that without having sinful thoughts, you are a better person than I. Uh, I always want to mount a bazooka on the front of my car when I go through Atlanta. I believe I could clear out some traffic if I was able to do that, uh, but I would probably get in trouble with the law. Uh, but uh, uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, uh, we all battle with sin. Does that really matter that our Savior was sinless? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15. Let's stand together as we read the Word of God. We're going to read this one verse and go to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says this, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Catch that last phrase. Tempted in in all points, uh, in all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, that we have your word that we can hold to, that we can study, that, Lord, we can trust. And dear God, you promise that your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, may you speak to our hearts and lives today through your word and through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, today that you would do a work in every one of our hearts and lives. Lord, I know that uh, in a church like this, the overwhelming majority of our, our folks here in attendance today would profess that they know you as Savior. But dear God, there could be some that have been deceived. They they assume they know you, but they've never really personally come to know you. I pray, Lord, that today you'd speak to hearts and lives. And if there's anyone here that is not truly born again, show them, Lord, their need of Jesus today. Give us your strength and power. And dear God, may you just use us, Lord, to, to stand for the glorious gospel of Jesus. Because it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that came and died for us. And so, Lord, just uh, bless your word now in a special way. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. You know, going back to the idea that, and you know, sometimes I've had people tell me this before. uh, 
uh, over the years, uh, when you've been preaching as long as I have, you, you hear certain things. Uh, uh, many things that I've heard over the years have been uh, uh, complimentary, and uh, and I appreciate those. Uh, sometimes I get some constructive uh, criticism, and when it's constructive criticism uh, that uh, that has a purpose and can help me grow, I thank God for that too. Sometimes you just have folks that come at you and uh, you know what, uh, they're coming out of left field and no matter what you say to them, they're just going to get further in the weeds. Uh, I, I had somebody come up and say one time, say, Preacher, you just rely way too much on that Bible. And I thought to myself, what am I supposed to rely upon? Just come in here and tell you fairy stories and, uh, you know, uh, you know, once upon a time and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, man, the only foundation I've got to share with you is the Word of God. And so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I want you, I want you to, uh, to be, uh, uh, driven to think. I want you to, uh, you know, ponder things. But remember, the foundation is always the Word of God. And, uh, you know, any, if we have, uh, if we have a, a reliable Bible, then keep this in mind. Any other speculation that we might come up with, no matter what, uh, you know, are basically built on just, uh, you know, the, the fallacies of our own mind. A good question to ask ourselves. Is it necessary that Jesus came and lived a, a sinless life in every aspect. Some years back there was a guy that came out and very famously said, well, it's really not important that Jesus was born of a virgin. In fact, he was probably the illegitimate child of Mary and a Roman centurion that raped her. And that was just the story they came up with to cover. And I thought, good night, somebody's been chasing parked cars. And there was a whole lot of people that believed that stuff. You know, I got news for you. He is either who he said he is or, or he's a fraud. Okay? And so, you know, is it really important that Jesus came sinlessly, lived a sinless life, died a, died a sinless death? And, uh, and, and is it really that important? Yes, it is. I mean, could, somebody will say, well, you know, couldn't he have just been a, a, a really good man? Well, the Bible reveals that Jesus had to be more than just the best of men. Uh, otherwise, He could not be our Savior. All right, so let's go ahead and just jump into this uh, the, the best we can here by the grace of God. But let's just start off at the beginning. Uh, uh, think about this. Our Savior is sinless in His birth. Now, I, believe it or not, I struggled over... Uh, uh, my wording here. When I first wrote down on my outline, I put our Savior was sinless in His birth. And I got bothered about that. I said, you know, there's nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ that is past tense. Okay? He is ever present. He is who He is. Uh, when, 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 uh, when He spoke to Moses out of the burning bush there in the book of Exodus, He didn't say, I was uh, that I was. He said, I am that I am. So I went back and changed everything and put it into the present tense. So our Savior is sinless in His birth. Uh, by the way, from the very beginning, did you know that the first prophetic promise that we have in the Word of God was literally looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There in the Garden of Eden when uh, Adam and Eve sinned and, uh, and God came and, and put the curse upon the serpent. And in that, in that context right there we find the first promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, it says that I will put enmity between thee, talking about the serpent, and the woman. And between thy seed, talking about the serpent, and her seed. It, did, it did, does not say, and Adam's seed. It said, her seed. 
Okay? It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is the first prophetic promise of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ that I can find uh, in the Scripture. Uh, listen, Jesus is the promised seed of the woman. You say, well, preacher, why in the world does that even matter? Well, let's look at Romans chapter 5 and uh, verse number 18. It says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Now let's stop right there for a second. What does that mean? When Adam sinned, Adam and all of his seed, all of those that would come after him, all of his heritage, his lineage that would come after him, all of them were placed under condemnation. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, he had to break from that bloodline that came through Adam. Let that sink in your mind now. That's why the Bible says her seed, not his seed. You say, but wait a minute, uh, Mary was born of, of uh, those that were from Adam's uh, uh, you know, in, uh, heritage. And that is a true statement. But the bloodline biblically comes through the Father. Who's the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ? God Himself. That breaks the bloodline. Go back and read the first part of Romans chapter 5 verse 18 again. It says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Okay? The, the, the righteousness of one. Who is that one? That one is the Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfilled that which no other man could fulfill. Listen, you know, I've, I've known some great individuals in my lifetime. I've known some people that, that honestly speaking, when I was around them, I, I felt like I was closer to God just because of the fact that I spent time with them. But the truth of the matter is, none of them measure up to the Lord Jesus Christ. He and He alone was that righteous one that had the ability to come and be our Savior. And, and, and then beyond that, not only in His promise that He was coming... But he was sinless in his conception. This may not be a popular thing to say in many circles, but I'll say it anyhow. Life begins at conception. You say, well, I don't agree with that. Help yourself. Doesn't change reality. Okay? Life begins at conception. Jesus was sinless even in His conception. We find the promise back in the book of Isaiah and chapter number 7 and verse 14. It says, Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. Now some modern translations have changed that word and says, Behold, instead of a virgin, it says, Behold, a young woman shall conceive. I got news for you. That is a bad translation. There is a big difference between a young woman and a virgin. Okay? It was important that Jesus was born of a virgin. Now, by the way, we find the fulfillment in Luke chapter 1 and verse number 35 when when the angel was speaking to Mary and letting her know what was going to come to pass. And by the way, when the angel came to Mary, go back and, and, and back up just a little bit, and the angel says, hey, you're going to have a child. And, and she says, how can this be? And basically putting it in in a little bit more modern vernacular, she was saying, I've never been intimate with a man. How in the world is that possible? Here we find the explanation. Luke chapter 1 verse 35 says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I mean, from the very moment of conception, God took upon Himself human flesh 
and was there being developed within the womb of Mary. You say, well, I don't know if God could do something like that. Well, I want you to uh, go back and think to Genesis chapter 1. And if God could uh, come down and upon the face of the waters and all of a sudden say, let there be light. And there was light. If that same God said, let the waters gather together in one place and the seas gather into another place. And it was so. And, and then that same God said, let, let the earth bring forth abundantly and, and, and talk about all the animals coming forth. And if that same God could reach down and take the, the, the clay, the dust of the earth and fashion a man and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Listen, if that God can do that, he can certainly overshadow. A, a virgin and she is impregnated by the power of God Jesus sinless in his conception sinless in his genealogy I'm not trying to get a little bit too deep for you this morning but let me just give you something I think has always been neat you, you look in two different uh, places in the Bible I've had people say uh huh look at that there's errors in the Bible there's errors in the Bible. I can prove it. Look at the genealogy for Jesus in the book of Matthew. And then go over to the book of Luke. And look at the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Luke. It doesn't match. There's an error. No, there's not. Let me tell you what the deal is. In the book of Matthew, we find the, uh, the genealogy of Joseph. Okay? That was the legal claim to David's throne. Luke, on the other hand, has the genealogy of Mary. You say, but it says Joseph, but it says who was married to Mary. And the reason they did that is because it was never appropriate to put at the head of the genealogy a woman's name. In Matthew, you have the legal claim to David's throne through Joseph. In Luke, you find the spiritual claim to David's throne through Mary. Isn't that amazing? You know, God just puts all kind of stuff out there for us to see. If we'll just accept His Word. I mean, even in His genealogy. So, our Savior is sinless in His birth. Second of all, our Savior is sinless in His life. Did you know something? There was never a time when Jesus did not comprehend his identity. Uh, years ago, I, I remember hearing a particular song, and, and it was uh, talking about uh, when Jesus was little. Did he know this, and did he know that, and did he know the other? And uh, I, I got to thinking about that thing. I said, you know, that's just about dumb as rocks. Of course he knew he, who he was. Listen, now, uh, again, this is my opinion, but I believe I'm right. Okay, uh, the babe in the manger, there as a babe in the manger, he was still the one that was holding all of creation together and all things consist by his power. I don't know about that, that's just a babe. Uh, but it wasn't just any babe. It was God in flesh. By the way, even as a child. Have you ever wondered, you know, uh, Mary had other children, by the way. Can you imagine what it must have been like growing up being the half-brother or half-sister of Jesus? Can you imagine? I mean, always they'd be saying, why can't you be more like Jesus? <laughs> and I can imagine they're saying, yeah, of course. He says he's God. I mean, why, why, uh, how can we measure up to that? He said, do you think... He ever got a whipping for disobeying? Now, he might have got a whipping, but it wasn't rightfully coming to him. You know, one thing that, that speaks to me, when he was 12 years old, he went up to the temple, and they left, and, and left him behind. Didn't even realize he wasn't with the group. They went back to find him, and there he was, having a conversation with all the experts of the law. And they said, oh, look, yes, we were worried about you. I mean, uh, he says, don't you know, I'm about, I'm about my father's business. Even from the age of 12, he knew exactly who he was 
and what he was here for. I believe with all my heart in his entire life. I mean, there was never a time that he did not comprehend who he was. And his life revealed that he was not like other men. Isaiah 53, 9, one of the great chapters of the Bible that talks about the coming Savior. It says this about him. It says, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Now catch that, done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. I wonder how many of us would even dare to think that maybe we can measure up to that thing that we've never done any violence and we've never had any deceit in our mouth. I'm afraid I've been guilty in both of those areas. And probably most of you have as well. Okay? I mean, his life revealed he wasn't like other men. And his life revealed... That he, sur- uh, that he surpassed by far all of mankind. First Peter chapter 2 verse 21. I love this. It says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow His steps. Now catch this. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in His mouth. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Our Savior is sinless in his life. Let me take it one step further. Our Savior is sinless in his ministry. You know, our Savior is sinless in his ministry. You know, I've been a thank God for the ministry that God's given me over the years. I've been a pastor now going on 45 years. Does that sound right? Yep. Been a pastor going on 45 years. You know what? In 45 years, I've made some dumb mistakes along the way. Look back and say, man, that wasn't the smartest thing I ever did. Wow. Wow. I sure am glad that, uh, that folks love me even when I messed up sometimes. Amen? Get, gave me a chance to get, get it straightened out and get it going in the right direction again. Man, I'm thankful for that. Don't, don't you know we serve a Savior who never one time said, Oops, I messed up. Sorry, disciples, I was telling you something that was wrong. Let me go back and correct that. Never one time. He was sinless in his ministry. You know, his ministry, uh, he had a lot of critics. He had a lot of critics. But, uh, but his life was above reproach. By the way, let me just go ahead and mention this. If you're trying to live for God and you never get any criticism, you're not doing a very good job living for God. Because if you live for God, somebody's not going to like it and they're going to criticize you. No matter what you do. He said, that's not fair. No, who said life is fair? Just stay true and faithful to Jesus. That's all that matters. But Jesus had critics. He had critics. But his life still measured up. John chapter 8 verse 44. Here Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And uh, he didn't always speak to them with with great kindness. Because they were uh, rather uh, obnoxious in their uh, attacks against him. And notice what Jesus said. He said, ye are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it and because I tell you the truth you believe me not which of you convinceth me of sin and if I say the truth why do you not believe me you know Jesus said okay tell me what I've done wrong tell me where I have sinned point it out bad enough you know why? Because he was sinless in his ministry. And, and you know, the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's got a consecrated and an unchangeable priesthood. And today, the Lord Jesus Christ is our, our high priest in heaven. 
I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. Whenever I go to God, I'm so glad I don't have to go and uh, find me a goat or a lamb or some turtle doves and kill them and and rip certain parts of their bodies out and put it on an altar and set a fire and burn it up before God and and confess my sins. I'm just able to go to the Savior and say, Lord Jesus, You were the perfect sacrifice and my faith and my trust is in You. Would You forgive me of my sin and he's got that unchangeable priesthood that maintains our cause in the in the sight of God man I'm so glad for that Hebrews in chapter number 7 and verse number 24 it says but this man because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them oh I've said this many many times over the years but I still remember listening years ago and Lester Roloff was preaching uh, and he'd say well bless God he can save you from the guttermost to the uttermost that always blessed me I said, no matter how far down you are, he can save to the uttermost. That's good. All right. And uh, see, he ever liveth to make intercession for them, for such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once when he offered up himself for the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forever more you know there's a, a, a thing that is uh, pointed out here in this scripture that is so important but in the old testament the high priest before he could ever offer up a sacrifice for others he had to first go and offer up a sacrifice for him himself before he was equipped to offer up sacrifices for others Jesus didn't have to offer up a sacrifice for himself therefore he could step in and take care of our sin debt forevermore he's that great high priest who alone can do that and today he's our advocate in the presence of the father and one of these days he is also going to be and i believe it's going to be soon he's the soon coming king of kings man i don't know about you but i I, you know i see all the stuff going on in the world you see what happened in el paso you see what happened in in dayton ohio uh just a few days earlier there was another shooting somewhere else they've become so numerous that we lose track of them man i sure am glad that when jesus comes back he's going to settle all that mess when he takes over dear friend uh there won't be that kind of stuff going on Praise the Lord for that. He's our soon coming King of Kings. And then last of all, our Savior is sinless in His character. He's sinless in His character. Did Jesus have the capacity to sin? I remember many years ago there was a very famous uh, Bible teaching ministry that one of the leaders of that ministry took the position, well, Jesus could have sinned, but he didn't. If he, if he couldn't have sinned, how could he be tempted? You know, I don't understand all of this stuff. There are some things in the Bible I just accept by faith because the Bible says it. Okay? But let me tell you something. I believe he was tempted in every point just like us. That's why he feels our infirmities he knows what we are facing but as God in the flesh sin was contrary to his nature you know I've shared this before but one of my favorite dreams is when I get when I'm flying I get to fly when I'm dreaming that's a blast man I, I really like it and just take off Zoom around. Do figure eights. Throw my notes on the floor. Okay? But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, whenever I'm dreaming, I can do that kind of stuff. But you know what? There is no way in the world 
that I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, get up on top of the roof here at Ranch Baptist Church and say, hey, y'all watch this. Because I'll fly just like a rock. It's not, it, it's not my nature. I don't have the capacity because it's not my nature. Jesus being God, God is not a man that He should lie. He can't sin. He can't sin. Jesus, in fact, because He had no capacity for sin Himself, that meant that He could take on our sin in our place. In, in, the, in the Bible says in, in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, it says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You see, without sin, He could literally absorb the sin that was on our account and then deal with it. You see, if I tried to pay for the sins of somebody else, I can't do it because I'm carrying my own sin debt. Jesus alone could take our sin debt. Only the sinless Jesus could take away our sin. You know, 1 John 3, 5 says this, And ye know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him is no sin. Did you guess that? He was manifested to take away our sins. Let me give you three, th four thoughts here and I'm quitting. Number one, a mere good man could at best only offer temporary deliverance. I remember some time back hearing the testimony of evangelist Tim Lee. Tim Lee was in Vietnam. He got both legs blown off in Vietnam. Preached all over the nation since that time. God's used him greatly. But when he was laying in that foxhole bleeding to death, another soldier intervened, prayed over him, helped stop the bleeding, took care of him until the medics got him. And even though he lost both legs, his life was saved. And I remember seeing the video where those two soldiers were reunited after many, many years. Man, it was exciting to watch them. Why? Because that was the guy that saved his life. You know, a, a mere good man could step in and do something magnanimous for us and, and could save our life and could help us. And guess what? That is a wonderful thing. But all they can do is be a temporary blessing. As good as that man was for saving his life, that man could not save his soul. The only one that had the capacity to save his soul was Jesus. He alone. Listen, Jesus offers more than rehabilitation. Every time somebody there's a shooting, some, some politician, I guarantee you in the next couple of days, is going to say, we need education on proper gun safety. Listen, you can rehabilitate people till the cows come home, but until people start getting regenerated by the power of God, we're not going to see anything change. Jesus offers more than a second chance. Man, I'm glad that I've been given a second chance a time or two in my lifetime. But listen, Jesus offers more than a second chance. Man, He offers a clean slate. He says, come to me and I'll wipe it out. And you can start fresh. Je Jesus offers more than mere forgiveness. Oh, that's good. But He promises to never remember our sins. I love it. The Old Testament it says that He'll take our sins. And cast them behind his back and remember them no more. You say, how in the world can God do that? Because the sinless Savior stepped in and took our sin debt upon himself and disposed of it for eternity under his blood. What a great truth that is. Listen. I, I used to like to read a lot of uh, mythology when I was younger. 
And I noticed something as I read, read about the Greek and the Roman gods. They were a bunch of wicked, vile. I'm trying to come up with a good adjective, and I can't think of one that's appropriate. <laughs> but they were, they were, they were, woo. You know why? Because they were inventions of wicked, vile people. All of the invented gods of the human race had the same as sinful tendencies of those that imagined them. Only Jesus stands apart as the sinless Savior. He alone. Therefore, He alone can meet our needs like none other. All He requires from you and I is just trusting faith. Now here's the thing. What kind of Savior are you trusting in? One that's just like you? If you got a Savior that's just like you, you're in a mess. You need a Savior that's sinless, perfect, holy, righteous, that has the capacity to take away your sins. Only one qualifies. His name is Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let the Lord speak to your heart today. Let me ask you, first of all, do you really know Him? Do you really know Him? Is He your Savior? Have you trusted Him and Him alone? Listen, He's the only one that can do it for you. And then, think about this. We've got a sinless Savior. Don't you think He at least deserves our devotion? Don't you think He at least deserves our love, our worship? our service God help us let's do what we ought to do because of this wonderful Savior just a moment we're going to stand and we're going to sing an invitation song if God is dealing with your heart the altars are open today you mind God whatever he's speaking to your heart about Lord Jesus move in our hearts and lives today by your power and your presence in Jesus name we pray Amen let's stand